um, uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me uh, to be here, rather than, rather than there. Um, and listening to these kind of wonderful presentations today is kind of blowing my mind how sort of richly interrelated they are, um, which uh, I think is, an, is the evidence of some rather clever programming going on. Uh, so, as John said, uh, my name is Christopher, I'm an artist, and I'd like to speak on behalf of my collaborators about our response to some of what's happening in the world. For us, that response is in the shape of a long-term artwork in the form of a startup, a company that we're starting together. So first, I'd like to introduce the ideas behind it and then talk about the venture itself. And then also about how we're developing this through the field of art by making exhibitions like the ones that uh, we can, will be able to see on the screen to your left. Uh, and maybe I'll talk specifically about one of the shows we're working on now, actually. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, so if I get a little abstract in places, don't worry. I uh, will come back down to earth, I promise. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I hope we'll get to have um, a discussion uh, towards the end of this session. And when we do, please don't um, feel the need to be polite with any questions. Uh, that you may have, no need to hold back. The problems could be the most important things to talk about. But I'd like to start with um, talking about where this is all coming from for me, like personally and artistically. So my family is from a place that really no longer exists. For three decades during the Sri Lankan Civil War, the Tamil homeland of Elam was self-governed as an independent state led by a neo-Marxist revolution. It was supposed to be an autonomous nation based on equality for all, irrespective of class or gender, race, faith or sexuality. But this idea was eventually crushed by an authoritarian president who had come to power by appealing to neglected rural voters and opportunistically inflaming racial hatred to get elected. Eventually, he leveraged this hatred and fear of the Tamil minority to dissolve parliament and to rule with executive powers. So my family left that corrupt pretense of democracy to look for a better life in the West. Of course, centuries earlier, a similar decision to leave had been the founding imperative of the United States itself. A minority that felt that they didn't belong in the old world left to build upon a new world. And crucially, eventually the old world had to change to be more like the new one. But late at night, on November the 8th last year, Canada's citizenship and immigration website crashed as millions of Americans reacted in despair to the results of the US presidential election. Now, The economist Albert O. Hirschman asserts that this option of leaving is actually the ultimate means of ensuring political accountability. His um, 1970 treatise, Exit, Voice, and loyalty is a study of responses to decline in companies, organizations, and states. And it's become kind of secretly influential amongst certain tech people. Now in it, Hirschman makes the argument that the possibility of exit gives power to the exercising of democratic voice. And his biggest example of this is actually that of America. And, as I said, how like, the old world ended up having to change to be more like the new world. But if you feared a tyranny today, where would you go? Like Canada? Really? 
influenced by Hirschman's writings, the Silicon Valley blockchain entrepreneur Balaji S. Srinivasan has suggested that America could be seen as the Microsoft of nations. Its code base is written, or constitution, is written in an obfuscated language. It systematically propagates fear around security issues. And it behaves ruthlessly towards key suppliers whilst favouring its rich corporate clients. And the world has no choice but to buy it anyway. But Microsoft's monopoly was eventually broken, not directly by a software competitor, but by internet companies like Google operating in a completely different dimension that hadn't previously been imagined. And now that there's pretty much nowhere on the planet left to leave to geographically, Srinivasan proposes that exit today could take a different form in a completely different dimension. But what could that new dimension be? Well now, the proximity of our bodies is characterized by the geographical distance between points in space. I think about 6,630 kilometers between us here and them there. But the distance between our minds is increasingly characterized by a completely different metric, geodesic distance which is the number of degrees of separation between nodes in a network. Now, geodesic cartography doesn't map nation states, it maps states of mind. And increasingly, technology is not just connecting us intellectually and emotionally, but also making it possible for more and more of us to meet in person. So now, the cloud formations of the internet are beginning to take physical shape in the actual reorganization of bodies. We already see tons of people connecting on the internet and, for example, moving in together. But as more and more people connect, it could become increasingly possible to see the cloud formations of the internet crystallize, not just within homes, but into whole towns or even cloud cities. Actually, Srinivasan imagines how eventually the like entire cloud countries could materialize out of thin air into a kind of reverse diasporas. In other words, they kind of start out internationally distributed, but come together to be physically concentrated. And faced with increasingly mobile constituents who can transfer their loyalties more easily, even potentially to a multiplicity of cloud-based organizational forms, perhaps existing nations will be forced either to serve their constituents better or to face collapse. So in this age of technologically accelerated dislocation, and given diminishing public confidence in existing political institutions across much of the world, how might a more liquid form of citizenship actually be implemented? And my big question thinking about this is to do with whether this kind of trajectory can intensify the privileges of the few or actually democratize those privileges for the many. So out of these questions has emerged, I suppose, our long-term experiment in the form of the real estate technology company that I'm starting with colleagues. It began with a kind of sci-fi thought experiment of asking what a new Elam could have been if that idea of a self-governed state based on equality for all its citizens if that idea had been imagined as a distributed network rather than as a territorially bounded nation. Instead of opposing the existing system by force, as had been attempted unsuccessfully by my parents' generation, could perhaps a new economic model be grown without friction in an entirely different dimension? 
perhaps a new Elam for all, where an alternative form of citizenship could be a choice rather than a hereditary privilege. So what we're developing is a flexible housing, a flexible housing subscription to enable global living beyond national borders. We're bringing together an inter interdisciplinary team of specialists from the fields of technology, art, real estate, finance and design to try to transform how housing could be organised. So how the subscription will work is that a flat rate monthly fee will give you continual access to high quality apartments in specific neighbourhoods and cities around the world so you can move around with ease. And because of the flexible way in which these properties will be inhabited, they can be bought and sold optimally. So over time, the capital gains from trading property could, in effect, end up subsidising the cost of the subscription itself. We want to make a new type of distributed home, a beautifully commodified technology like your iPhone, and infinitely customisable with your personal settings and services following you on demand in the cloud from city to city. And by repurposing capital gains from the optimised trading of the continually revolving property portfolio, we think that it may even be possible, at least in theory, to keep reducing the cost of the subscription until it could eventually become a trivial cost, like the cost of electricity in a lot of the world. What we're starting begins with the conviction that perhaps a real long-term structural transformation might be more likely by just making something that works better, by making something that people want, rather than by requiring a moral choice based on an ideological criteria. So existing real estate markets concretize an antagonism that I think is kind of fundamental to our present economic system, which is between renter and owner. And this produces the classic dilemma that many people face between the relative flexibility of renting where they live versus the uh, perceived security that comes with the equity benefits of owning where they live. So we want to enable much greater flexibility even than renting with actual security free from leveraged personal debt. And we see this as the greater luxury of a model based on collective access over anything that would be possible with individually owned private property. Essentially, we want, we want to make homes that work more like informational goods as streamable, perhaps, as music, or movies, or now even cars. And if you remember, before, before Netflix, or, or Spotify, or certainly before Napster, um, I don't think many of us would have been able to imagine that all this commercially available media could be available legally for a relatively small subscription fee. But of course, with music or movies, there's no marginal cost to the reproduction of this type of media. And that's certainly not the case for housing. But my colleagues and I think that housing could be even more compelling in subscription form. Because with housing, the actual asset that's being subscribed to could over time subsidize the cost of the subscription itself. And if we can make this work, we think that this could eventually form the basis of a sort of democratized offshore economic system optimized for collective access rather than individual ownership. A kind of opt-in alternative, perhaps, to nationally bounded organizational forms. And this, of course, in line with the reality that more and more people are moving around and working in increasingly flexible ways, whilst the cost of travel is becoming cheaper and cheaper. And we believe that all transportation will be entirely decarbonized within our lifetime. And the more that jobs are automated, the more that the future of immaterial labour <coughs> might look increasingly like what artists do. And as homes more and more become a primary site of production,
for an increasingly post-labor economy. Could this means of production, the home, be reorganized beyond existing property relations? Of course, the art world has always been good at prototyping new lifestyle formats, like loft living, to cite a very obvious example of, of something that uh, the art world did like more than half a century ago and that has since become a kind of mainstream aspirational lifestyle uh, choice. And now the art world has become pretty good at reproducing around the world the lifestyle of globalization. And I mean, I myself have been living basically on the road since finishing art school. And the gallery-based work that I've been doing over the last few years has come from looking at how contemporary art established itself, where my family's from in Sri Lanka, almost overnight. And paradoxically, in the immediate aftermath of the violence that defeated that revolutionary proposition of Elam perpetrated under the veil of national sovereignty. And then kind of seeing in Sri Lanka over the last few years this, I suppose, accelerated microcosm for how contemporary art, like what contemporary art actually does in the world. On the front line of globalization, as part of the processes of gentrification, <coughs> by which cities around the world are remade. And so our business model has really come about by thinking about how some of these processes of, of globalization, gentrification, prototyping new lifestyle formats, how some of these processes might be constructively reorganized. So this venture was really born out of our understanding of what art does in the world. And I'm very happy that we have here in Verbier my collaborator, curator Annika Kuhlman, who is our artistic director at New York, at New Zealand. Annie, could you wave and stand up so people, <laughs> people know who you are? So Annika and I have been working on a lot of these ideas together from the beginning. And now we're developing together through the exhibitions that we're doing some of the long-term thinking that is leading this venture. So I understand if you, uh, uh, if you can't bring yourself to take your eyes off this screen <laughs> right now. But when you do, uh, on the screen to your left, um, we've been looking at, um, at uh, documentation images from, uh, from presentations for the 9th Berlin Biennial, uh, curated by DIS last year, and the 11th Guangzhou Biennial, uh, curated by Maria Lind um, a few months ago. And for these first exhibitions, we asked ourselves how we might use the space of art to communicate maybe with more depth and complexity than would be possible with other communication forms like advertising. Or to put it another way, we asked ourselves, how could a brand communicate as an artist? But how we're inhabiting the space of art with this proposition is evolving as we develop the business and for one of the exhibitions we're working on now, we're doing something more like why a car company might make a concept car to experiment with new technology. So we're collaborating with engineers and designers to think speculatively about the living space of the future. And this includes developing an automated aquaponic indoor farming system, a high-tech re-engineering of straw bale wall construction, and even photovoltaic furniture all by way of making what we hope will be kind of beautiful artworks made out of the technology that we could end up using to make beautifully intelligent homes. So if you'll be in Berlin at all between March and September, do come check out that exhibition at Hamburger Bahnhof called Moving in Every Direction. And artistically for me, I think part of the value of doing these exhibitions is in imagining a kind of Great. Uh, imagining a kind of alternate reality. It might look a lot like a reality that we would recognize, but with a crucial part of its logic altered in a way that could change, every, could change everything. And I think, for me, part of the artistic excitement will be in translating what's begun as an imaginative proposition into a potentially transformational reality. 
And we can imagine that our exhibitions could develop over time into a sort of open R&D space alongside the process of producing that reality. A space for us to think about some of the more long-term questions raised on the journey that we're embarking on, upon. For example, what new social forms might be produced through the transformation of housing? So to give you an example, um, the, the nuclear family kind of came about through a previous industrial revolution and was literally concretized into the shape of the home. And now even by institutions like marriage are kind of financially underwritten by mortgages. So if the way that housing works could be blown open through a new industrial revolution, then what kind of new social forms could that open up? Now we don't have all the answers to these huge questions, but we think that developing this, at least in part, <coughs> through art can help us make a very different kind of company that's driven perhaps by imagining a very different kind of reality. <laughs> of course the future is unpredictable and the success or failure of what we're embarking on can only unfold over time. But we think that at least seeing how the space of art can be used to develop ways of doing commercial or political communication, perhaps with more subtlety and nuance, is for us at least interesting to think about. Thank you.